Hey, how's it going? I'm Ella Feingold and I'm an orchestrator. And with me is my cat Mooney, who decided to hang out because he loves orchestration just as much as his mom. Um, I'm using a new screen with a new camera, so I don't know how the resolution's gonna be. Hopefully it'll be okay. Um, my apologies if it's not. It's kind of making me look super goth. It's like a ton of light. Anyways, uh, let's get started. Um, this is another cue from the film Boxing Day that comes out uh, on Amazon Prime, or um, yeah, Amazon Prime on Friday. Um, this audio is coming back probably mono. I'm going to look into um, how to set up a microphone and get everything so that the audio comes from internally from the computer. So thank you for being patient. So yeah, here we go. This is the cue. dig in here. I'm just going to close this out. So this is the sketch. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is gone today. Um, God, a lot of disclaimers, sorry. So this is the sketch here, um, and this is the finished orchestration. So um, why don't we kind of just go section by section, and I can talk about some of my concerns and um, then, you know, go through what I actually did. So we've got something in the piccolo doing some motion up high. We have something in the flute, which obviously is out of range for the flute, um, the bottom voice rather. Um, and this doesn't particularly, not a, it's not a bad range for the flute, but I mean, if we really wanted it to project, you know, sort of uh, this G and an octave above is where it really projects. But um, we don't have an alto flute auxiliary. Um, and uh, then there's some stuff in the clarinet. Um, so right off the bat, you know, this is obviously um, Christmas music, it's lighter, it's airy. So for me, my goals are sort of clarity and transparency and refinement and um, avoiding heaviness. So th those are my general goals for this um, particular cue. So we've got, you know, clarinet stuff, flute stuff, piccolo trill, and it's all sort of the same color. You know, there's no double reeds. And so I thought that for this melody here that this would be a lot more, um, emotional and tender if this were in double reeds and be a lot more colorful. So if we go section by section, that's exactly what I did was I gave this melody to the oboe. And, you know, why didn't I give it to the cor anglais, the English horn? I mean, perfectly playable. And the reason I didn't was, you know, it's Mark Dolcissimo. I, I want it, I just want it sweet and tender. And to me, I thought the bassoon would be a better choice for something that's a little more tender and less, um, I don't want to say that the English horn is always melancholy, but bassoon is more tender here. So I'm just going to go through what I did with the MIDI and then I'll kind of go back uh, as I'm explaining the orchestration and talk about where I used people to um, refine things and, and, and help people. So um, the clarinets were, you know, basically pretty literal um, and so that's that there was no brass whatsoever so you can obviously see I added a lot of brass um, and the piano is pre-record so that's not something I orchestrate I'm just putting it in the score as a nicety to the conductor um, for pitch percussion we have orchestra bells and mark tree and that's all lovely. We've got some motion happening here in the harp and they sort of, you know, sort of step into the spotlight here in measure eight. 
and do this rising um, arpeggiation. And the strings, we have basically just have a string choir doing some harmony and some touches of pizzicato. So to look at, you know, now the full orchestration here. Um, so right off the bat, I've got this high D here. And what I end up doing with the strings is I have them doing half tremolo, half ord, because to me, without the trem, you know, this is motion. You know, what was written here, there's motion in the harp. So I want to orchestrate that motion in the strings without it being overwhelming. Like this would be, in my opinion, you know, too over too overwhelming if I, you know, tried to do like trem, um, sorry, fingered tremolos and stuff like that. I mean, you know, it's a fourth, it's playable, but that would be too much, I think. So doing the half trem, half chord is just a nice way to put a little bit of um, motion in there. And um, you'll see, you know, with the notation here that I have these people get off an eighth note early. And that's just a courtesy to prepare them for the pizzicato that's happening here, which was in MIDI. And you'll notice that I also put an artificial harmonic, which sounds with this D here in the violi, and I marked it non-trem as just another sort of refinement behind it. Um, and if we go to bar three with the strings, so with pizzicati, I mean, it was pretty literal. I decided to split it between the violas and the seconds. This went to the celli, and you'll notice that I also put it in the basses just for more body. You'll notice that I changed the notation from an eighth note to a quarter note with this laze vibre tie. I mean, I could have even marked it, you know, con vib or something, because believe it or not, there is a distinction to be made between, um, you know, a little poco vib um, on, on a pizzicato note versus sort of a, a dead tone um, where they just pluck the note. Um, so just wanted to point that out. And um, moving right along from measure four to measure nine, nothing crazy here, um, just sort of divided things out and paid attention to the part writing. Um, I, you know, purposely, because I didn't want this to be heavy, I saved the bases for measure seven. Um, there weren't even any bases written. And I also added this C here, where this, there was an E flat. Um, and this is kind of a thing where like, if you're concerned if the composer would okay this or not, you know, that's a place where you would cue it, you know, if you're just not really sure. So that's for the most part, the strings. Um, yeah, I mean, again, nothing crazy, just part writing, making sure that, you know, there aren't any huge holes in the writing and just making sure that everything, you know, really, um, voice leads nicely. I mean, you'll notice that I, um, oops, you'll notice that I, you'll notice that my screen disappeared. <laughs> Why is that Sibelius? Um, just that I doubled up on this melody here. You know, I have these people going D, G down to E and these people going D, G up to the C, which is here in MIDI. So I, I want to make sure I have enough people on that to bring that out. Okay. So nothing mind altering there. Um, some interesting stuff in the harp. So this was written on one harp. And as I've mentioned, I have two harps in previous cues. So the first thing I do with this harp is I split out the hands just because it's easier for them to play <laughs> with two hands. And um, I put in the pedaling, I mark it as all ring to just let them know that this is not a, you know, a dampening thing. Um, depending on where you are, sometimes I'm told that the default is to dampen things very quickly because they don't want to ruin a take. And, and um, so I've sort of just learned through the years of marking all ring or doing a lot of these laissez vibre ties to let them know it's okay to let stuff ring because I've been told the default is to dampen. Um, so I split this out between the hands. Um, and the only thing that I did here, again, I'm in the sight reading business. So this is just a courtesy that I, you know, split out the hands here to let them know 
again, this is probably something they're doing anyways, but because they're sight reading and I just want to get it right, um, it's just a nicety that I do. You know, a mentor of mine says that um, every part that you write is like a, you know, like a love letter <laughs> to a player, letting them know that you're thinking about them, that you care about them. And that's kind of true. It's a, you know, I'm putting in the fingering here and I'm not saying that you need to do that, but certain places, you know, I just do it. And it is kind of like a love letter. You're, you're letting the player know that you've studied their instrument, you know, in a very intimate sense, you know, what goes into it and what's difficult and what's easy. And, um, so yeah, just think about that when you are, you know, going left to right and writing parts that it, it is a, whether you want to call it a love letter or just, it is a letter to the player. So just kind of maybe keep that in mind. So now what I did is, um, the second harp, I use this as resonance or as Ravel loves to say, bathing in sonorous fluid. So what am I doing? Um, I'm using harmonics here um, and I'm getting these repeated Ds. So these Ds here are sounding with this. And you'll notice that I'm exploiting N harmonics, that I'm going between B natural and C flat. And why am I doing that? Um, or, you know, even here, B sharp and C natural. And I'm doing that because if they continue to re-articulate the note, that every time they re-articulate it, the note dies and then it gets, you know, re-triggered. So by using an harmonics, you're constantly letting the strings ring longer. It's just a way of achieving, you know, more resonance. So, okay. Um, let's have a look at the percussion. So you'll notice here that it's just orchestra, you know, it's a touch of orchestra bell, and this was likely, you know, a wind chime or a mark tree. So what did I do here? Um, so there's a, fra a phrase we sort of always like to say, which is, you know, know who you're writing for. Um, and I knew who I was writing for. And when you know who you're writing for, you know what to write. Um, so I knew that this particular player had tons of esoteric percussion. I even had the instrument list. And so um, I chose to use a steel marimba with soft mallets, and I'm doing this as a way to color the harp. Um, that's something I did. I could have cued, but I just knew the composer would love it, and it's Christmas music. So I thought this was really a nice call here. Um, and then they had... Um, the orchestra bells, and I wanted to punch this up a little bit more, so I ended up um, having them in octaves. Um, song bells, I guess you could sort of think of them as like an alto glock. Um, so that's that. And um, I just sort of orchestrated this out a little bit by, you know, the harp gets the whole gesture, and I'm sort of starting this on steel marimba, and then I'm bringing in the song bells and then I wait for the very end to bring in the orchestra bells. Um, as a general tip, don't write orchestra bells in octaves. Um, or, uh, orchestra bells are, you know, also glockenspiel. It's the same thing. Uh, they don't sound great in octaves, I think, except for when they're isolated pitches, where it's just boom and they're out. Um, but doing things, well, not only is it not fun for them to play in octaves, depend especially depending on the tempo, but it just, it's just not a particular sound that I really enjoy. But here it's it's nice. Um, so this I wrote for Mark Tree and Key Tree. Um, so I'm just getting more, more color. And I'm orchestrating the climax of this by just a touch of a small triangle with a really thin um, beater to really just illuminate the top of that. So that's you know, um, refinement. Um, and so let's take a look at the brass because there was no brass written whatsoever. So what did I do? And, you know, um, should I have cued this? You know, could I have gotten fired for this? And this was a case where I just texted the composer and said, hey, you know, I think, you know, some brass would be really lovely. And he said, yep. So I added it. If I didn't have the opportunity to speak to him, I just would have cued all of this stuff. Um, so in the horns, um, 
you know, I've, I've added a, a, a harmony note here in the bassoon, and they're basically just playing off of what the clarinets are doing. I did it because I just wanted more body. Um, and um, that's it really for the horns. Um, you'll notice that I'm using flugelhorn rather than trumpet because I still want a horn-like color. And you'll notice here that at the very end that I am orchestrating the diminuendo. I'm not being lazy and having the whole herd come out all at the same time. Why? Because, you know, this is good orchestration, I think. Um, and so it makes sense for the flugelhorn or the trumpets or cornets, whatever you're using, for them to leave early. Just like in woodwinds, it makes sense for the double reeds to leave early because, you know, um, they can't go to Niente. Um, so this is just a little touch and they're playing for one bar, not even a bar. Um, and you'll notice that it's just staggered that I bring the flugelhorn out and then the trombones and that the tuba and the horns last the longest. So let's talk about what's happening in the trombones and the tuba. You'll notice that I put the trombones in bucket mutes. Why? What, what's a bucket mute? Why use that? Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with bucket mutes in jazz. Um, I particularly like using bucket mutes in quiet settings in trombones because I find that I get free horns from putting a trombone in a bucket mute. Um, as a, a good little sort of MacGyver cheat, I'll, you'll hear me say MacGyver a lot. MacGyver was this character, for those who don't know, in the 80s, the sitcom, I'm the sitcom, the sh you know, action show where he would just make things happen with like a match and dental floss. And sometimes I feel like being an orchestrator is like that, where you're just like, I need this to happen in this, but I only have this. And so sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I feel like Bob Ross <laughs> putting a tree in the corner and other times, yeah, I feel like MacGyver. And so bucket mutes, I'm being MacGyver, I'm fooling you by making you think that these are French horns. And trombone players can disagree, but to me, they sound like horns. And it's a great way, like, if this, say you needed, um, you know, I have six horns, but say you had three horns or four horns and you wanted this really nice unison melody in the horns, but you also wanted horns to do the harmony and accompaniment, so you'd be screwed because you don't have enough horns. So putting bones in a bucket mute is a nice way of... Um, giving horn-like harmony and I and I like having you know colors be um, um, just structural in terms of separation you know um, so that's why I put the trombones in the bucket mute and I also am a person that loves putting tuba in straight mute and the reason I do that a lot is in loud music it goes really well with a contrabassoon and can help that instrument project. Um, I also find that it makes a better bass for trombones at times because it takes the body out. Um, but in quiet settings, I also feel like it blends better with the horns, especially, you know, in the bass clef and up, um, you know, getting up higher in the bass clef. So that's why I chose to use it here. I didn't want, you know, a lot of body and um, so that's why I did that. And lastly, with the woodwinds, I mean, there's not really a lot to point out. I mean, same thing that I did with the um, flugelhorn here. I did this with the double reeds, with the oboe and the cor anglais. I brought them out. And I mean, sure, I could have brought the bassoon out, but I didn't think it really mattered. Um, and you'll just notice a small little detail here. You know, this is piccolo, so this sounds up the octave. Um, and just notice that the line direction um, changes because I, what I'm trying to avoid is this. And then them having to jump down to the C. So a lot of times I will alter line direction um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much it. There's some really small touches here where I took, um, bass clarinet and clarinets here and just 
had them um, color the pizzicati. So yeah, that's this cue. Um, I hope this was helpful. As you can see, there's part writing that goes into this, there's refinement, and there's just, um, you know, a student was asking me the other day about my scores and that they like looked really detailed and which I'll take as a compliment. I mean, I certainly want my scores to be complex, but by no means complicated. And they were asking me, you know, how do you do that? And I mean, the simplest answer, which I hope isn't dismissive, is that, you know, when you're refining and you're thinking of colors, that's fine and that gets you into the ballpark. But when you start to put yourself into the mind of the player, that's when I think things become more detailed, like like this, with just knowing how hands should be split out and um, with the harmonics and, you know, here with giving them a courtesy eighth note um, to diminuendo or, you know, prepare for a pizzicato. Like, for example, if this happened to just be a long arco note, what I would probably do at some point is mark an up bow at the end. And the reason for that, if you think about it, if the bow is going down and they need to prepare for a pizzicato, now they have to jump back up. So if I were to mark it with an up bow, as they get up, they're already prepared to come down on a pizzicato. So that's like a courtesy of thinking for the player. And so these little things of putting in eighth note breaths, or sorry, breaths, rests, um, or even here, you know, putting in, as you can see in the MIDI in measure three, it's a whole note. And here I made it a dotted half note tied to an eighth and that there's just a little bit of a breath here for them to sort of re-energize. Um, I'm someone that just likes to write in breaths rather than using commas and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I just thought to get things more detailed, I mean, here's another thing I'm just noticing looking now. I mean, I'm sure there's tons of other stuff that I missed, but I'm sort of orchestrating the diminuendo or the, uh, the sorry, not the diminuendo, because we're crescendoing. I'm orchestrating the resonance here where I'm getting, you know, an open, I'm getting a C, and then I'm using the harmonic, and I'm, I'm coloring things, you know, I'm thinking about everything. Um, looking back at this now, I probably shouldn't have used harmonics. I probably just should have used ordinary notes because we're getting louder um, going up. But, you know, this is an interesting gesture because some people are at mezzo forte and they're coming out and the harp and the pitched percussion is emerging as people are coming down, they're going up. So, you know, sometimes we make mistakes and I don't think this was a mistake, but I think this was a refinement that was just too precious that didn't really make a difference. And I could have easily just had them go C, 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 you know. Um, so yeah, I'm just having one last look. I mean, I think that's really, really it here. There's nothing else to point out. So um, tried to organize my studio and show some of my scores. I've got bookcases full that I need to bring in here. So yeah, um, thanks for tuning in and have a wonderful morning, afternoon or evening. I think I'll change up the ending. Maybe um, stay weird and be kind. All right, see you on the next one.